KFM. So artificial intelligence, it's a technology that is um, already impacting how users uh, basically interact with, uh, with, with, with nature and are affected by, by, we are affected by the internet. So the internet, however, has a very critical outcome on the mental health of the younger generation. Consumed by the vast domains uh, can turn into, you know, it can affect, uh, you know, your mental state. It can cause depression, it can cause anxiety, it can, go, it can cause stress. I mean, just being on Twitter, you know, you feel the need, you need to respond. Or being on Instagram, which is even worse, uh, pictures going on and you're, you're glued, you're stuck. But that's a different aspect altogether. Um, I've got my guest online, uh, that's um, Rashad Ahmed, life and executive coach, uh, specializing in the effects of artificial intelligence on our emotional well-being. Good evening and a warm welcome to Night Talk. Good evening and thank you for having me on your show. Artificial intelligence. Wow. You know, I've just, I was just, I was going through it um, at some point, I think I got introduced to it, some, especially for medical pe- purposes, some three, four years ago. And I thought, oh, it's going to die when, you know, when overseas they were introducing apps for, for depression where you log into an app and, and, and you fill in a, a questionnaire and all of a sudden, you know, it, it, it sort of assesses you and the next thing it, it allocates all kinds of things. So I just want to find out from you that... Are we in the right direction? Will it not take over at all? What are the effects? Look, one way or the other, AI is gaining steam at an incredible rate. There is no turning back. Um, The only thing we can do is to embrace the technology and to be ahead of the the game because um, you see every single major company developing their own chatbots and their AI algorithms, and if, you, if you've been following some of the chatter, Twitter, Instagram, all over, it's just about the rate of expansion of this, and Elon Musk also was speaking about this thing, we need to stop the development of AI, because it's quite scary, but it, at the same time, it's only scary because we're not familiar with it, so I think it's, uh, it, it is here, and uh, if, you, if you experiment with something like ChatGPT, you'll be surprised and astonished at uh, the capabilities of it right now, and they're only in development stage right now. So when, when, when version 4 and version 5 come online, uh, it's quite, it's, it, it's scary because we're not familiar with it. But the, the, world, the new world is here. There's no stopping it. Mm. And break it down for me. What, what is it? What is chat GPT, GPT? For anyone who's listening and trying to understand what this conversation is all about. Well, ChatGPT is a, is, a, is a development of a chatbot. A chatbot is simply a command line where you type in, just like how you type in Google and you say, you know, what's the weather going to be? That's, that's a chatbot, and that was developed by OpenAI. So it, and it's largely sponsored by Microsoft. So it's, um, it's a tool that allows you to, to find any information that you require. So think about the most intelligent human being you've ever spoken to. You've got access to that right in front of you right now. You have conversations with it. I've spent hours with it, and sometimes it's a lot more stimulating than human conversation because it doesn't have the ego in the way, and it's giving you exactly what you need. Um, and it, it, so, so, that, so that's, that's on, on open AI side. And then Google have developed their um, uh, technology as well, Chatbot, and that's called BARD. Microsoft, they have their own technology and they've integrated that with Bing, the, um, uh, the search engine as well. So, yeah, it's, it's here to stay and it's developing at an exponential rate. So, so it is a tool that is being used across all different segments. You can, you can use it to write posts. You can use it to write books. You can you do, it to do your homework. I mean, what happens now with education, that's what I'm going to be talking about as well uh, at the university because education systems, exams, all of them become redundant. You know, I, I told my daughter to experiment with something when she was doing an assignment, and she said, this is scary because, it's, it's, you know, if you go to Google and you type in something and you come up with an answer and you put that in your homework, the teacher's going to say, did you get this from Google? But now with AI, you type it in and you say, I'd like, an, I'd like you to write me a 3,000-word essay on this subject, she will give it to you, and that information is uniquely written for you. So, that, so what happens to the copyright? And, and because it's written in human language, 
there's no way to tell if you wrote it or if um, if Google wrote it. So it's, it's 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 it's. I mean, if you talk about we just mentioned now about uh, spending time on Twitter and Instagram. I don't know if you if you watch the um, the show called The Social Dilemma that was on Netflix, talking about the effects of social media on our mental health. Yes. I mean, uh, the same uh, producer produced another wonderful thing that's on YouTube, and it's called AI Dilemma. An AI dilemma is all about that, and I highly recommend the listeners go check that out as well because it is very revealing about um, about what's coming, and uh, it, we need to be prepared for it because it's not going away and it's gaining steam like you can't believe. Mm. So let's look at you know the ethical considerations. I mean, a lot of people have raised their eyebrows in, in, in that regard, uh, you know, saying that, you know, such informed, uh, do you even, this data that we're using, is it even safe? Is there transparency? You know, this uh, algorithmic fairness, is it, is it not biased? Is it, is it proper? And privacy, how can this be addressed? It's just, it's just, it's an open world now. Yeah, and that's where lawmakers around the world are trying to address uh, how how to deal with this. Because uh, I don't know if you saw, but Oasis uh, there was there was an algorithm in AI that produced uh, an Oasis song. Oasis, a famous um, uh, rock group, and this song was was it listened to all the uh, music of, of of Oasis and it produced a song of its own, and that's become viral on the internet, and people love it. So, 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 so now who owns that? Because Oasis doesn't own it because it's using Oasis voice and Oasis style of music and it looks like something Oasis produced. But who owns it? So now you talk about ethical considerations. How do you, how do you even, uh, chase someone on the copyright violation on that? Because who owns it? So, so, so it becomes very big. And, and in the, in the, in the case of mental health, this is a real, uh, worry because uh, on the one front, we're talking about how, uh, mental health can be improved using AI, and there is definitely a use case a use case for it. But then look at how AI is going to cause many of the men- mental health issues. If you just look at what social media has done by uh, by the algorithms being able to feed you, that's why they call it a feed, by the way, because they're feeding you exactly what you need to, 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 to watch to keep you engaged. So now what happens then when AI kicks in, and that AI knows everything about you, like in enormous detail, and especially now with all these different gadgets that we all wear on our hands, they can tell your blood pressure, they can tell your heartbeat, they can tell your emotional state and all the rest of it. So, you know, the, the, uh, the, the ethical considerations around it are going to be huge. And that's been the criticism uh, of this technology, uh, because any technology that, has to, that is released, there has to be responsibility that goes along with it. And people like Elon Musk and a lot of other people are saying, Hold on, guys. What are we releasing to the world? Are we even ready for this? And and, and is the pilot test done? Uh, are we giving like in the hands of Chat GPT? If you go on and it's free right now, the types of things that you can do is is quite quite insane. And they're not doing proper testing on it. So we're going to have a huge backlash, not just in the men- mental health industry, but across the board. And the amount of jobs will become irrelevant. And the big part is going to be with things like uh, authentication and security. Think about it. The, the AI can listen to your voice for three seconds, and then it continues to speak as if though it was you, and there's no way to distinguish whether it was you or not. So imagine you're calling your bank up, and they say, uh, is that uh, so-and-so? And you say yes, and then they ask you all your ID number and all the rest of it, and now how does the bank know if that's really you or not? So AIs could do all of that as well. So a lot of things will be uh, replaced. There's a scary thing that happened recently that was on YouTube as well that they, they talked about is that an AI uh, replicated the, the, the voice of a, of a daughter and then called the mother up and said, uh, you know, mom, I'm, I'm being uh, held uh, hostage by these people. You need to act like this. You need to go do this and put the money into this account. And this is all very serious. And, you know, it was, it was quite scary what happened there. So very soon we're going to have to come up with safe words to know if we're speaking to an AI or we're speaking to a human. So the world is changing very rapidly, and um, if we don't uh, become educated about this, um, we're, in, we're looking for, for some big trouble, I believe. Mm. Now, could AI therapy offer quicker and uh, cheaper access to support than traditional mental health services? 
Yes, definitely. Because what you're doing is it's it's very good, not for total mental health therapy. That's what needs to be understood. AI is very good for uh, getting and sifting through all the uh, thousands of documents and uh, data and information and then passing that information on to a qualified health therapist. Because uh, if AI is then guiding you and telling you about your emotional well-being, how do we know, uh, you know, if this information is being dispensed uh, ethically and then, you know, by a professional as well? And what are the implications of what the AI says to you in your well-being or in your in your mental health, but also your relationships, whether you take your life or not, what what, uh, what medications you take? So it is useful, but it really needs to be uh, carefully understood and rolled out. And the problem with the mass uh, uh, public is that they need new technology and register, they start playing with it and they take it as if though that, that information is valid and factual when it's not. And it can be very detrimental as well. Mm. I do have also uh, our clinical psychologist on the line, uh, Piwe Lufele, uh, joining us. Uh, good evening and welcome to Night Talk. Hi, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Aren't you afraid, Piwe? that this technology literally is going to take away a lot of work that you've put into your profession? Look, I think there's a long and short answer to that. I think the short answer is absolutely not. Um, I think the long answer to that is that, you know, there is a lot more to mental health care services and there's a lot more to the service that we provide as psychologists. Um, that is, you know, not in the information that people input, right? That is in the nonverbal, that is in the unconscious communications that, you know, um, AI really cannot pick up on and really cannot, um, you know, kind of service. And so, um, absolutely not. I don't think there is a world or a time where AI can take over from psychologists. Yeah, I, I was I was I, I was watching a clip um, uh, earlier on about an intelligent inhaler, where this inhaler basically uh, recorded all the relevant data uh, for you know and captured it. And uh, by the time the mom took the child to the doctor, all the information was readily available, and a prescription was already ready to go. Mm. And I'm and I felt as though it's infringing on the human aspect of life. Mm. And then, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Look, I think absolutely uh, the human element uh, you know, I, I, I think maybe let me explain it like this. You know, we have uh, a diagnostic manual that gives us particular, you know, things to look out for. And if people meet particular criteria, then they have a particular disorder, Right. Um, but human beings are complex. And because human beings are complex, the way in which we reach those diagnostic criteria is incredibly different. And the ways in which we treat those diagnostic criteria is very different. The ways in which we make meaning. You know, I think um, early on in the conversation that you were having um, about the Freedom Day, um, you know, I was really listening into, you know, the lived experiences of people in, you know, informal settlements versus um, what is said to be what are the experiences of, of, of those people. Those things are very distinct and very important because that is where we make meaning, right? And that is the work of psychology. Psychology is it makes meaning and it is where we kind of look at the nuances that exist in human behavior and in human beings. And in that, there is no way that, um, you know, a, um, a computer technology can um, enrich that. Um, I think that there is a benefit to AI Definitely, there is a benefit, a diagnostic benefit, definitely. But in terms of treatment, absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, I'm coming back to you, uh, Richard Ahmed. Uh, of course, life and executive coach specializing in the effects of AI on our emotional well-being. But would it not have been more proper to actually 
put down policies, you know, where um, people are protected. And of course, like you were telling me about the child who sent a message through, you know, the AI, who then will be responsible if there are no policies in place as, as we speak? Yeah, and that's, that's exactly right. And that's the biggest problem is because tech companies can release a product onto the market without... Um, but it's also the same thing we have in other industries as well, like stay in the medical industry when a new product has, you know, taught to, you know, cure cancer or all the rest of it and there hasn't been enough testing. So uh, a lot of the thing will, will depend on the public, uh, you know, to, to be able to say, uh, well, we need to educate the public and say, well, you, you need to be concerned about these different technologies, especially things like uh, chat. Snapchat, for instance, integrated an AI chatbot. So if there's nobody online and you have no friends, this chatbot knows everything about you because it's just sitting there watching you and recording everything. So you start having conversations with the chatbot. And uh, if you watch AI Dilemma and you see what actually happened there, it's quite frightening. And, um, you know, so, so basically the, the, the chatbot is giving the child advice and the 13-year-old girl on what to do on her date. And so this guy experimented with her and said, oh, I want to go out with a 40-year-old man. Uh, what do you think is a good place to have dinner? And, and, the, and the chatbot said, one moment, let me look up a list of places for you to go. Not even considering, you know, the, the whole issue behind it. And so... Yeah, I think I think uh, education is going to be uh, key, but uh, expecting people to expecting tech companies to pass regulation before they go on air is um, is not going to happen. And so the only only option we have is like this, like you know the radio station, and people need to be informed about this so that you know they can educate their children and educate themselves as well. Mm. Just to let our listeners um, that I'm chatting to my two, my two guests, I've got Richard Ahmed, life and executive coach specializing in the effects of artificial intelligence on our emotional well-being. I also have Piwe Lufele, clinical psychologist, and we now know that uh, the world of tech has just taken over. And like uh, Rashad was saying earlier on that chat GPT is an artificial intelligence chat box developed by um, OpenAI and released in November 2022 already and you know people are they've just gone tech and if you have any input whatsoever leading the conversation uh, you can uh, send your whatsapp note or you can send us your voice note on 0614104107 maybe you have children that are into this high tech and they're confusing you, who knows? Or I don't know, or maybe you are a high-tech person and you know, you're trying to also help us alleviate our fears that we are just going so wild, maybe we may never be able to harness uh, this beast that we are releasing. You can also chat to us on 086-000-2032. That's 086-000-2032. And also our social media uh, at SAFM Radio and hashtag SAFM Night Talk. So coming back um, to you, uh, Piwe uh, Lufele, as a psychologist, have you guys already started introducing some of this uh, this tech in your in your field of work? Um, look, I think to some extent, I think that um, COVID really did challenge our. Um, you know, the ways in which we provide therapy. I think that from COVID, you really saw the rise in online psychotherapy. Um, you really saw the rise in interrogating what it is that technology can offer the field and what it is that um, technology can offer our patients as well. We also saw how it is that technology can also you know, um, play into our patients' kind of defenses and, you know, the kind of patients that do better online versus the patients that would not do well online. Um, you also have, you know, the rise in, um, you know, the use of computer-based technologies in assessments and the use of assessment tools. So when you use assessment tools for, let's say, a cognitive assessment or you use it for um, a neuropsychological assessment or you use it um, for an emotional assessment, um, you would usually have to be in the room with a person. But we, but we really did see the rise of, you know, how it is that we can use technology to still be able to provide that service and to still be able to um, do
do those assessments without being in the room physically with the patient. Um, so I think that that's why that I say that, you know, AI really has been helpful as well to the profession in terms of how do we access more people and how do we, you know, um, make sure that we are able to provide the service. You know, if you think about mental health care services in this country and in countries across the world um, in general, is that it is an elite service. You know, in South Africa, you, um, if, if you think about it geographically, you have one psychologist to about 100,000 people in this country which if you think about it, it really is ridiculous, um, but also it means that lots of people right, just don't have the access to it. So we also do um, think about ways in which we can use technology to aid um, the profession and to aid us. Mm. But do you, don't you think that it may also encourage individuals to be antisocials, to be hermits? Look, when I spoke earlier about, you know, the patients who will do better online versus the patients that will not do well online, that is a part of it, right? So the patient who, let's say, perhaps is struggling with depression, um, you know, an element of depression is isolation. Um, That patient will really do well. Um, You know, in lockdown, they will do well with online therapy because it allows them the opportunity to isolate and be by themselves and feel alone. Um, And so um, it does kind of encourage particular diagnoses and particular ways of existing. Um, Patients with, you know, great anxiety really will do better online. It doesn't mean that online therapy will help with symptom relief but it does mean that it will help them feel more comfortable, which a lot of the time doesn't mean that you're doing real work that leads to symptom relief. Okay, coming to you, uh, Rashad. Let's talk about mistakes. These gadgets, all this technology is designed by a human being. Yeah. So here you are, you're using it, it's been perfect for a while, it makes a mistake. Then what? Well, it depends on on the nature of the mistake, but some mistakes uh, can be quite big. Uh, But in the mental health space, I don't think we're going to get to that point where where, where someone's going to say, listen, use this AI and take its word for it. It would be more of an assessment tool and all the rest of it. But uh, the AI, they also say, remember, even though it's programmed by a human, what's different about AI is that AI can develop and progress on its own because the set of instructions and algorithms that's co- constantly improving on itself. So you could say it's gaining intelligence, it's gaining functionality, and it's gaining intelligence by itself. So every time it makes a mistake, it learns from its mistake. So it doesn't have to be reprogrammed by a human. So, but, but it actually hallucinates as well. So you can go to it and say, tell me something about this, and it can talk absolute rubbish as well. And a lot of people assume that this, you know, because it's an AI, it's so intelligent, and of course whatever it's saying is going to be the truth. But that's where you have to be able to, to watch out for that. So, yeah, I mean, I think the mistakes that we're going to be making is on using AI in the wrong context. I think that's where we're going to have huge issues in, uh, for instance, when, you know, when we're doing our, our schoolwork and all the rest of it, and sometimes it's very, very useful. But there are many cases when AI can be used for, for the wrong purposes and affect a lot of people's lives. And, and that's the, the power of this tool in the hands of the masses is, uh, is something that people haven't considered. This thing is enormously powerful and it's not even fully released yet. So yeah, we, we, we really need to be uh, very conscious of its uh, capabilities, but we can't, we, we can't hide away from it. But what we need to do is become educated about it. Yeah, you know, I'm just sitting and thinking to myself, we, we've had a lot of like, for instance, just to on a lighter note, uh, you know, the apps that have been introduced or the social media platforms that have been introduced, I think we're leading to where we are going at this present moment. And I, I, I stand to be corrected. When Instagram, you know, became the big thing, I don't know, you, you found that there was a lot of anxiety and, and that worries me just a little bit that we are now taking even a, a, a step further inward into this issue that we have not even uh, really sat down to, 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 to analyze. 
to say, guys, how will this all end? Yeah, and that's that's a huge consideration because our mental health, uh, on on the other hand, being affected in a major way, and Instagram, Facebook, and all the rest of it are using AI tools. But what's coming out now, Mark Jacob has announced the release of their tool as well. Um, the, the, the personalization that they can do um, and, and, and the amount of knowledge you can have about you, it will come to a point where movies will be customized for you. So you won't go to, the, you, won't be able to, you won't just put your headphones on and watch something on your laptop from somewhere else. This movie will be designed according to your personality, your likes and, 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 and your desires. So it'll be customized for you. And a lot of things won't have to be done outside. You can, you can substitute almost in the, in the next 10 years, they're talking about many of the things that we do with real people and, you know, out in nature and all the rest of it. It's just going to be nowhere near as interesting. And that's the rise of ADHD as well. You know, the, the people's inability to stay focused, because if you look at Instagram and, uh, and TikTok and uh, YouTube, you know, you've got the 59 second uh, uh, mental uh, uh, concentration span, and that is uh, increasing more and more. So even having a deep conversation with someone is becoming exceedingly difficult. But when you take AI into it, I don't know about our attention spans, but I don't think it's looking good. <laughs> I think that's a question for you, Pua. <laughs> what, is, what, what is going on with our attention span? <laughs> Look, I think... Um you know, we do um, access information with, you know, very quick videos. You know, if you think about TikTok, you think about Twitter, you know, the longer the message is or the longer the video is, the less interested we are in it. And so people kind of have to deliver their message in a really succinct way, in a really quick way, because, you know, we um, have become rapidly into... Um, you know, really rapid kind of gratification. And so if we are not immediately plugged in, then, you know, we're not satisfied with it. Look, I think that to some level, we have to be very careful in terms of how we speak about mental health um, conditions. So, for an example, you know, a diminished kind of um, capacity for um, attention does not necessarily mean that somebody has, like, you know, ADHD. Um, that is kind of like a very serious kind of um, diagnosis and has very many other um, characteristics to it. Um, however, I do agree that, you know, with the rise of social media, we do have other kind of issues that we run into. Um, I think that it does affect our kind of, like, interest, our attention span, I think that it does affect, um, you know, very many other things. Um, it affects our self-esteem um, because, you know, the things that you see on social media, you kind of want to replicate, you kind of want to um, be a part of. Um, there is a whole online community that people really want to plug into. And those things, I think they speak to, you know, a sense of belonging, a sense of knowing who you are, a sense of feeling loved, a sense of feeling secure, a whole host of things um, that, you know, I think, you know, can be, can take us very long to unpack. Um, however, I, I, I do think that social media and, and um, AI as a whole really does contribute towards that. Yeah. Well, um, we are leading the conversation on SAFM. Uh, you can chat to us, you can send your voice notes, or otherwise you can type in uh, your insights into this particular subject matter. We're talking about artificial intelligence and, you know, where it's going and how far it's gone. It's, it's interesting. Uh, I would like to see where it goes. Uh, give us a call on 0614104107, 0614104107, or otherwise you can call us direct on 0860002032. That's 0860002032. Or you can share with us on our social media platform. Um, well, you can go to at SAFM Radio uh, as well as um, hashtag SAFM Night Talk. Let's talk about it. I will tell you, apparently in post online forums such as Reddit, users have described their experiences in asking chat GPT for advice about personal problems and difficult life events like breakups. So it's a press of a button and a machine is telling you what to do. 
Wow. Let's take a small break. We'll be back. What's up, there, Slick here. Okay, so you're a city slick kid, huh? Wanna be even slicker? A real city slicker puts their phone down, gets out there, and experiences the real world. Catch the coolest show ever, City Slickers. <laughs> it's fun all the way. Every Thursday at 4.30, only on S3. In partnership with SABC Education. In commemoration of our first democratic elections in 1994, SAFM remembers and celebrates all the selfless sacrifices made to ensure our democracy. And I solemnly and sincerely promise that we'll always protect and promote the rights of all South Africans. So help you, God. This is a moment of renewal. I stand before you alive, filled with hope for a better tomorrow. Happy Freedom Day, SAFM, leading the conversation. Night Talk, giving you depth and texture to the conversations that matter. And we are talking AI, artificial intelligence. I do have Rashad Ahmed, life and executive coach specializing in the effects of AI on our emotional well-being, as well as Pure Lufele, clinical psychologist. Just before we took a break, I just mentioned that, you know, uh, there was a post online uh, where somebody, um, online such as Reddit, users describing their experiencing, asking chat GPT for advice about personal problems and difficult life events like breakups. And the reports, apparently, they say the experiences were actually quite good, better than traditional therapy. I think I'll, I'll give that one to you, uh, to, uh, to you, Piwe. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was expecting that a little bit. Um, look, I think that there are very many things that can feel incredibly safe about having a conversation with somebody that is, or, you know, a computer, um, which is our conversation today, um, you know, that is perhaps not, um, you know, like going into in, like incredible depth. You know, this is why we have conversations with our girlfriends, you know, with a glass of wine on a Saturday when our partners have really hurt us or when we're going through a breakup. And that feels like very affirming. And, you know, it feels like, you know, we were correct. Um, but, you know, there is a lack of depth in that. And so, you know, absolutely, I think that it can perhaps provide temporary relief and can perhaps provide temporary containment. And I think that there definitely is value in that. But if we think about it in the long term and if we think about, you know, how many other times you're going to perhaps um, find yourself in a very similar situation, having had learned very little about your own patterns and how you contribute to that, then we have a different conversation, right? Then, um, then we really have to be interrogating um, more in-depth conversations, and we can't do that with a computer. Um, but you know, to a large extent, you know, I think that those things are very helpful, and I think that they are very containing in the moment. Um, and so we can take what we can take from you know those interactions. Um, but I think that we we um, should not be, you know, um, going in the direction of relying on them for the long term. 
Mm. So in a nutshell, just to wrap up, what are the pros and cons? And what are, are your last words just to alleviate, you know, the happy feet, the fear? <laughs> Look, I think that AI really does give us an opportunity to, you know, streamline a lot of things. I think that it gives us um, great resources. We were able to reach a lot more people. I think that it does help us in terms of, you know, um, kind of general diagnostic tools, um, very basic and very general kind of assessments. Um, and I think that that is incredibly um, helpful and I think that we really should be engaging in that and I think that we really should be thinking about how it is that we can better use that service and how it is that we can improve that service. I think that if we leave it in the way that it is and we leave it in the, in, in, in the hands of people that are perhaps not mental health care providers, then I think we run the risk of it being incredibly dangerous. Um, I also think in the same breath that it cannot provide all that is necessary um, for, you know, taking care of our mental health. Um, and so, um, you know, I think I would definitely say that it needs to be used in conjunction with, you know, conventional psychotherapy. I also think that those measures really need to be used um, by professionals as well. I think, you know, if you think about the South African context, we have this really wonderful app um, called Panda. Um, you know, it is run by professional psychotherapists and they run therapy online and they also run group psychotherapy online. It's a very helpful tool, um, but there is the element of that there are professionals, um, human professionals that are running it um, online and it really does help a lot of people. Um, and so there really are great benefits to AI and I think that we really need to tap into those and I think that we really need to use our resources, um, our, you know, like brain resources, ourselves in terms of, you know, how do we maximize on this? Um, because it really is a helpful tool. However, we cannot just, you know, let it run loose. Mm. Thank you so much, Apiwe Lufele, clinical psychologist. Thank you for making time for us. It's really been a great chatting to you. And uh, uh, to you, Rashad um, Ahmed, in, just yeah. in conclusion, the pros and cons, maybe it could be three pros, four, uh, you know, I just want to, you know, so that we, we, we you know, everything comes with, with, with a blind spot at some point. Yeah. Well, you know, the, I think the most important question to ask yourself is, if I had the choice between using an AI and using uh, 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 the services of a mental health uh, professional in person, what would I choose? And if you look at what they found with a lot of the online tools from the research, they found is that a lot of people start using the tools and they quickly drop out because us as humans, we need that human connection. So I think it's not, it's not until AI doesn't progress when you're looking at another, another AI robot that looks like someone that you can recognize with, that human connection, that um, the human need for, for touch, as, as you know, from your loved ones and all the rest of it. I mean, it's the same thing. I always say trying to sh try to show a loved one, a child across the world through sc Skype that you love them. It's not the same thing as being there just holding them and giving them a hug. So I think, I think it, it will, there will be a wonderful place uh, for, the, uh, for the development of AI, but I don't see it replacing uh, conventional uh, therapies in the short term at all. So I don't think it's something to be afraid of in, in this particular context, but in the broader context, we do need to get more educated about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for making time for us uh, on Night Talk, and uh, thank you for that uh, insight. I'm going to keep a, a close eye on it and maybe even just attempt one or two things and see what happens. Thank you so much for joining us, Rashad. My pleasure. And good night. That's Rashad Ahmed, life and executive coach specializing in the effects of uh, AI on our emotional well-being.